in this budget. Joining us now to debate from our nation's capital, Andrew Coyne, national editor and columnist for the Maclean's Magazine. Susan Delacourt, senior writer in the Parliamentary Bureau of the Toronto Star. Finn Poshman, vice president of research at the C.D. Howe Institute. And Aaron Weir, economist with the United Steelworkers Union. Okay, everybody, I want to, first of all, thank you uh, for joining uh, our discussion this evening. Yeah, I also the Conservatives did you know, lay a lot of hints out in the last few days that this budget was going to deliver big time on innovation and on the knowledge economy. Did they? No. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much hinting they were doing in that regard. Uh, but just to, to address some of those comments, I think what's common, what people should bear in mind about all those things is, as important as those sort of micro things are, the big picture is also important. If you don't keep your debts under control, you get eaten alive. Uh, at the height of our deficit madness in the 80s and 90s, we were spending 37 cents out of every tax dollar just to pay interest on the debt. So anything else you might want to do with that dollar in terms of health care, in terms of innovation, in terms of helping people get jobs, what have you, gets, gets put, put aside. You're simply you know, running faster and faster on the treadmill just to pay off your creditors. So the, the notion that there's a conflict between the two, that if you're paying attention to the deficit, that somehow you're ignoring these other concerns, I think really should be set to one side. You have to control the overall situation to be able to attend to some of those uh, more, more selective concerns. Um, the other thing I want to say was about, about the, uh, the, the speech the minister gave is I actually think there is some truth in it. I want to say some nice things about them for once. Uh, that I do think they've been doing some very interesting things. This might make uh, Aaron's head explode, but on, on, the, on the free trade front, free trade with Europe, free trade with India, some of these smaller treaties they're signing, I think that's a very exciting agenda. I agree with Finn on, in terms of the tax cuts. There is a, you know, bit by bit, incrementally, hither and yon, there is a kind of a larger vision that does start to emerge over time from these guys. It, 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 as I say, they, they sort of take two steps forward, one step back. But that stuff's very exciting. The only thing I was dismayed to see missing from the throne speech in particular was talking about the economic union and enforcing free trade within our own country. And at one time in the, in the 2007 throne speech and in subsequent documents, including their election platform the last time out, they were talking very tough about we're, 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 we're getting serious about this, we're giving the provinces notice, get rid of your interprovincial trade barriers by 2010 or we're bringing the hammer down in the form of the uh, federal trade and commerce power. And we get to a throne speech and a budget that are all supposedly all about productivity and competitiveness and trade, and there's no mention of it. And I was sorry to see mm. that. And Finn, that's in quite distinction to the, the plans internationally, where Mr. Flaherty pointed out he wants his country to be a tariff-free zone, but apparently not within the country. Is that right? Well, it's, it's not quite right. There, 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 is a, there is an internal trade agreement. It does have a new chapter that, uh, that uh, will, be, uh, will be tested uh, in, the, in the coming while. It is unfortunate that a number of provinces have listed uh, exemptions for specific trades uh, with respect to cross-border mobility. Uh, that's something that the provinces are going to, uh, uh, over time, we hope, or we should hope, uh, change their views on. Uh, but uh, Andrew's right. There, there's no no new rhetoric about to exercise the federal power in this range. It is uh, it is a minor disappointment, but I'd say only minor because there there, there has been some some evolution on this front in the past uh, in the past year, and there are some changes that do need uh, do need uh, time to play out. Aaron, you want to respond to that? Uh, well, I do. I mean, I actually don't think there's a lot of evidence that there are interprovincial trade barriers uh, even exist. I mean, the McDonald Royal Commission uh, studied this a couple of decades ago and uh, concluded that uh, interprovincial trade barriers uh, cost the equivalent of 0.05% of uh, gross domestic product, so 1 20th of 1% uh, of the economy. And since then, most of the specific interprovincial trade barriers that existed have been done away with. I mean, the classic example uh, that people always used to like to whine about was the fact that in Quebec, you couldn't sell margarine that was colored to look like butter. Well, the government of Quebec got rid of that. So, I mean, I'd actually challenge uh, Andrew or Finn to sort of name five uh, interprovincial <laughs> trade barriers. Okay, so ask you a couple you're of on questions, you guys. Then. Presumably, the Trade Investment and Labor Mobility Agreement between BC and Alberta then made no difference at all. It, it, it didn't change anything if there are no trade barriers between provinces. In which case, second question would be, why is labor fighting the Trade Investment and Labor Mobility Agreement? Why are they tr tr fighting to prevent it from being extended to Saskatchewan? If it doesn't make any difference, if it's not going to change anything, you presumably have nothing to worry about. Well, I'm quite proud to have been directly involved in fighting <laughs> to uh, prevent that 
agreement from being extended to Saskatchewan. And the reason I did so is that the agreement sets up uh, these sort of secretive commercial tribunals that meet behind closed doors that give business the ability to challenge any government policy that's perceived uh, to in some way possibly impair some po potential investment opportunity. In so other words, it gives a trade barrier, in other words. Well, no, that's not that, that, that's well. No, I mean, that's that's not a, a trade barrier or an investment barrier. It's something that gives business the ability uh, to sort of harass uh, public policy, and it's also going to have a chilling effect on regulators because you know nobody wants to strengthen a standard or make a decision that runs the risk of their provincial government getting sued for up to five million dollars. So I mean Tilma was like trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. It was this legalistic approach that applied to everything um, you know, when what we should have had was a case-by-case -case approach where somebody came up with a list of the interprovincial trade barriers that exist, which I haven't seen, by the way, and came up with some specific solutions so, to okay, them. Okay, so lady and gentlemen, one. this is where the moderator comes back in and says, well, this is all fascinating. Uh, <laughs> especially in Saskatchewan. <laughs> especially in Saskatchewan, whereas we all know we have millions of viewers.